Patricia Goddard is extraordinary. You get one go at life, this is it. Her life directly mirrors an entire series of one of her shows. Truth or lying. Ooh. It's going to be weird talking about just what's me. Problems, problems, problems. Piers will be in charge as much as I allow him to be. Through it all, despite suicide attempts and depression and cancer, three quite tumultuous marriages, there's so much to get emotional about. <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> but she's a tough cookie. It ain't gonna be tears for tears. Bring it on, babes, bring it on. Trisha <laughs> Goddard, you've been a TV presenter on three continents. You've hosted shows in Britain, Australia and America for over 30 years. You've had 40,000 guests. <laughs> and now... You're sitting here, <laughs> and you're not in charge. I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm asking myself why. <laughs> it's nuts, your life. <laughs> and I say that respectfully, <laughs> but I've read some life stories in my time, but yours is like a running Trisha series. You know, I, I, I once had a therapist say to me, and I said the same thing, I said, my life's nuts, why is it like this? And this therapist said to me, you can do one of two things. You can scuttle along in the shadows in the hedgerow and no-one will see you and you'll be safe. Or, or you can walk down the middle of the road feeling the sunshine with your head thrown back, but you're going to get hit by a lot of trucks. So, uh... <laughs> you took that option. Yeah, yeah, the trucks, <laughs> yeah. So, roll on, truck. <laughs> you had all these guests, some of whom had, you know, terrible stories. Awful things happened to them. Were you able, because of your own experiences, which we're going to come to, mm. some of them very tumultuous, did that give you a real empathy yeah. based on reality? You know, you'd been through a lot of similar stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do feel and I do connect uh, with people and I hope that they connect with me. Now, I'm going I'm to admit something. Oh. I'm 55 years old. And I'm doing that because I'm about to ask you your age. So how old, <laughs> how old are you? 63. You're eight years older than me. You look about ten years younger than me. Oh. How do you look so youthful? What's I, that about? I, I, it's just me, sunblock. <laughs> um, I think, well, you've got a 30-year-old and a 26-year-old. Um, you know, when are you going to grow up? I, I, I... There's a lot of child in me, mm. but um, I've always had a lot of energy and I enjoy being active. How rich has your career made you? <laughs> Um, <laughs> my career's made me rich, but uh, marriage has made me poor. <laughs> 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 That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so what you mean is it's come in fast and it's gone out fast? <laughs> oh, no, they didn't go out fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> What are your extravagances? Shoes and clothes and cars. How many shoes did you own at the height of your <laughs> shoe mania? <laughs> Be honest. It's, it's pretty bad now. I tell you, Melda Marcos was a pipe. Well, how many have you got now? It'd be close <laughs> to, I don't know, 700, 800... What? Plus pairs, yeah. 700 pairs of shoes? Probably. Why? Um. Something between me and my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> How did you choose... I mean, these are fabulous. Um, but... I bought them to do my TV show in the States because I could run around in them. They work so well as a stage view. I got ten pairs in different colours. Ten pairs? Yeah. How much are they a pair? Um... God, I'm going to sound so vacuous. I don't know. Between $700... Dollars and a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars a pair. But and you bought ten pairs. When I die, I'll be buried with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> they won't fit them in. <laughs> Before you were a TV presenter, you had a couple of other weird jobs. <laughs> you were a hostess on a hovercraft. Yeah, even though I used to get so seasick, I would vomit more than the passengers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
You're also an air hostess with Gulf Air. Loved that. For a few years, about five years. Actually. Five years, loved it. Can you still remember how you used to do the announcements? Because uh, you did them in English and Arabic. Say that was Sedatin, El An, Mamna Al Tadhin, Hatta Wasulikum, Fimabna, Wamata, Washukr. What? And that. What, what is that, chicken or beef? Or? No, no, that's, that's the no smoking. <laughs> that's how long ago it was. Tricia, no matter what life has thrown at you, you've always been a survivor. That's today's Tricia. Tricia Goddard is the queen of confessional TV. Hey. But her personal story wouldn't be out of place on her show. Trisha's life, roller coaster doesn't even sum it up. Problems, problems, problems. She's had three failed marriages. They say if love is blind, marriage is a great eye opener. The cancer. Ooh. A husband who had AIDS and didn't tell her. At what point do you draw the line and say enough is enough? Trisha's genuinely been through everything. I had three men at the same time. She's not just got the T-shirt, she's got a whole wardrobe. It's a fascinating story, so don't miss it. Patricia Gloria Goddard was born in 1957 in Hackney in London. Trisha's mum, Agnes, was a nurse who arrived as part of the Windrush generation. She came across when she was 27, and you had to be brave to do something like that, I think. Agnes had got pregnant and married a Norfolk lad, Peter. Dad was a psychiatric nurse, and they met in Hackney. Trisha was the firstborn, closely followed by her three sisters, Paula, Prue and Linda. Dad was white, Mum was black. We stuck out. The girls were raised in 60s Britain, where being of mixed race was still very unusual. Trisha was always the only black person in her school, apart from her sisters. I remember lots of uh, nasty things said. Every morning, they're greeted by jeering crowds. The blackies are coming. When I used to get the constant, uh, wogs a matter, we all used to just brush it off, just say, well, why do you want to know? Trisha seemed to get it worse than the rest of her sisters. She was called Gollywog. Maybe because she was darker than us, maybe she did get more flack. I think she always wondered why her hair was curlier than her sister's and she would wonder and she felt insecure about it. When she used to say that to her mother, her mother would dismiss it and be like, don't be so stupid, you're not different. Trisha's mum died in 2004, taking a secret with her. Trisha and the family finally addressed the mystery. She'd always had suspicions that her father wasn't really her true father. I was sitting with Dad in a cafe, and I said to Dad, is there anything in that, Dad, about Trisha's colour? He, he looked upset, and he said, look, Mum didn't want her to know. A DNA ancestry test confirmed that both her parents were of African descent. Trisha's father turned out not to be her real dad. It had a massive impact on the family. Mum had had two black parents and not a white father. She doesn't know who her dad is. Me and my sister don't know who our grandfather is. She was devastated. I think she felt that it was a family secret that people were keeping from her. Even in the final days, her mother didn't reveal it to her, and I think that was the ultimate betrayal for Trish. Wow. What an amazing story. Yeah. And yet it's your life. And did you feel betrayed by your mother, that she never shared that with you? Yeah, I did. I felt very angry um, towards Mum. She could have told me, and, and there were excuses like I wasn't ready, I wasn't stable, then I was in the public eye and what have you. But I don't think I would have judged her. But it, it made a huge difference growing up. I mean, you know something's different, you know something's mm. kind of wrong and what have you. When did you really think in your gut that you knew the person you thought was your father was not your father? When I was five or six. I remember we... Because you were darker than your sister. I was so different from yeah. my sisters. In every way, in what I liked and what I did. 
Um, I remember walking around holding my dad's hand, singing, there was a hit called I Want to Be Bobby's Girl, if anyone remembers that. Yeah. And I used to walk around saying, I want to be daddy's girl. I mean, I idolised my dad. And I think as I grew older, I don't know what was going on between my parents, but I could always sense it. Did you ask your mother directly? No, because, well, I used to say things like, oh, you know, I've read something that you can't be darker, because I was darker than my mother. You can't, you can, can't be darker than your darkest parent. And she said, oh, that's rubbish, oh, that's silly, and what have you. And um, I remember when Mum was, was dying, she died at home, and Dad, and he's still Dad to me, nursed her. And we left, and I took the kids up the road to... Uh, they must have been, like, 14 and 10, up the road for a snack or something. And they were looking at each other and looking at me and, like, shall we tell her? And I said, tell me what? And they said, um... Oh, Mummy, we went up to Nanny's bedroom and we got Grandpa's hairbrush and we got some of this hair for you so you can do a DNA test. And I thought, oh, God, my kids have even picked up on it. And they probably got that idea from, from your television work, did they, or not? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but it, I don't remember discussing it with them, but it was always an issue. It affected me dreadfully in my life. I can't tell you how much it affected me. When did your father, Peter, your... Yeah. Stepfather, as it turned out. When did he discover he wasn't the biological father? Um, he says that... Well, I, I know, cos I, I tracked down an old friend of Mum's and she visited Mum in the hospital when she'd just given birth. She said... She took one look at me and said, ''Have you told Peter that's not his child?'' But uh, Dad said that he said... Something like, you know, we don't let me wait till a blood test to find out she isn't mine or what have you. So I think about when I was about three months old. Your mother confessed to him? Yeah, yeah. And who did she say the real father was? Uh, she told her friend it was just a fling at the West Indian Club. I've tried to track down that West Indian Club when they were nurses. I've looked through the ship's logs and what have you. But... I'd like to know from my health, like, from where my cancer comes from. I've got, mm. you know, health things, like my eyes. I remember saying to Dad when I... Oh, my God, I look just like Mum. And he said, no, you don't. And I was like... And you know from your... You did an ancestry test. You know for a fact that you both... Neither of your parents were white. That's what it is. Yeah, I'd like to know more about where I come from. I'd like to look at people and think, oh, you know, why am I the only one who's like this, this and this? I just... I'd love to know. It's one of those stories where if you were doing your show... I'd you'd be... get my researchers and yeah. producers onto it like that. <laughs> you'd be riveted. <laughs> Dispatched yeah. people. I mean, this is really tough for any young girl. If they hear you crying while they're chanting the N-word outside, mm. then you'll get it worse. I used to not know what to put on my skin because my skin was dull and super dry. But now I know. With Ole Retinol 24, my skin is fresh and bright. Let's go back to where it all started. You were born Patricia Gloria Goddard mm. in Hackney in 1957. Your mum, Agnes, had come over from Dominica in the Caribbean and trained Dominica. as a nurse. You went through a pretty hellish time. You know, being called golly, golly walk. And the N-word all the time. And the N-word all the time. All the time. And running the Especially kind of gauntlet team. at school. And... I got really good at, at, at my primary school going in the loo. What you do, you get toilet paper and you stuff it in your mouth so they don't hear you crying. Because if they hear you crying while they're chanting the N-word outside, mm. then you'll get it worse. I mean, this is really tough for any young girl, wasn't it? I remember the worst time was in the can canteen and, and um, I a boy... You know, we used to get our meals on a tray and a boy went like that with his fists, so all the food flew off the tray and everybody laughed and I was so embarrassed and I picked up everything and I did the you know, Oliver Twist thing and I went back to the dinner lady and I said, excuse me, you know, and she said, you've had... And I... Everyone was laughing, so I got up, I ran out and I sat on the step and I was crying and crying. I must have been nine or ten, crying and crying and I can see this teacher now Blonde hair, goofy teeth. He sat down next to me and he said, You've got to understand, you've got to toughen up. You've got to toughen up. We people in this country, we don't want people like you here. So if you're going to stay here, you're going to have to toughen up. 
But I was nine years old, and my teacher, who watched me get hit, was telling me this was my life. I thought I'd failed. I thought I wasn't being English enough, you know? And I remember that distinct moment, because I thought, no one's going to look out for you for the rest. You are in charge of you. I never told my parents, because I thought I would be letting Mum down. This sounds horrific, especially given your age. Did it, in a way, toughen you up? No, did, gotcha. it, did it make you more determined to succeed? Mum instilled in me I was an ambassador. <laughs> So I was gonna... I just wanted to do what I wanted to do the best way I could. Unfortunately, you, you carried on being the victim of varying types of racism, even where perhaps it wasn't intended. Notoriously, one of the characters on Beau Selector, the Channel 4 show created by Lee Francis, between 2002 and 2009, depicted you like this. Hello, people have been asked me. Trisha, how do you lose all that weight, boy? Me use me own recipe of rest and pay in the pot. But look at me now. Me look like a fine Caribbean queen. It's kind of staggering to me to watch that. That that happened in the 2000s, not the 50s. What, what did it make you feel like when you first saw this? Um, I couldn't watch it. And you told you you haven't got a sense of humour. Um, but, uh, and I know my... I, I've only discovered recently that my kids got bullied for it, really bullied for it. In what way? I mean, I still don't know the extent of it, but I know people would say rice and peas, rice and peas, and, you know, and do the... the all the exaggerated... It's the face. I mean, I can take somebody... If Billy's here... Yeah, well, she... Can't... You can probably tell us better than your mum, but what was it like for you? Yeah, it was all sorts of, like, rubber lips was a big one that, that came off that. Um, kids would shout at me at school and do Jamaican accents and come up to me in my face and, and you know, do Jamaican accents. And, you know, Mum has the most British accent I think mm. anyone's ever heard. So it, it was shocking and it was full on and it was relentless. And, you know, we'd even go to the teachers and say, you know, I'm being bullied. And the teachers would laugh and say, well, it's on TV, sort of get a sense of humour. I don't think people realised how racist it was and how much casual racism it emboldened. I mean, I think people will be shocked to see that footage now. He put a, an Instagram post up in which he apologised. Uh, back in 2002, I did a show called Bow Selector. I portrayed um, many black people uh, back then. I didn't think anything about it. Um, people didn't say anything. And I'm not going to blame other people. Um, I'll just keep it on. Well, um, I've been talking to some people and I didn't realise how offensive it was back then. And I just want to apologise. Um, you know, I just want to say sorry for any upset I caused, um, whether I was Michael Jackson, Craig David, Trisha Goddard, all, all people that I'm a big fan of. And um, I guess we're all on a learning journey. I mean, he sounds very sincere there. Did you accept it in the spirit of that yeah, message? Yeah, yeah. And we messaged each other privately. Um, absolutely. This Instagram post appeared in the papers. It gets on TV. People are talking about it. And unbelievably, this then sparks even more abuse to you than you probably had the first time round when all this was out. Way there. more. The nastiest, most evil Because stuff. now there's social media. Yeah. The fact you then get abused. I got abused. And I'm sure... You're the problem. And Lee got called, you know, grow some... grow a pair as well. Um, for yeah, apologising. For apologising. When you see what crawls out of the woodwork, yeah. this country does have a problem. I mean, I don't think Britain is a racist country. No, I don't But think I think it harbours a number of racist people. And it does bring them out. And they show themselves for what they are. You know, frankly, if they have a problem with your distress over that, they're the problem. Absolutely. <laughs> Tricia, let's take a look at how your high-flying career began. Tricia's life started to take off when, in her 20s, she landed a job at an airline. She was a flight attendant. She's always had a good look about her and a great aura. I love the fact that Trisha was an air hostess. She has that nature. You know, 
Tea or coffee? You can just imagine her saying it, right? Chicken or beef? Age 27, she received a marriage proposal from a passenger, Aussie politician Robert Nestdale. Just a few months later, she was married and living in Sydney. Another life was there in front of her. It was a sparkly life. She was desperate to succeed, really. Using Robert's connections, Trisha started trying to get a job in the media. She wanted to work in television. She really was just the most uh, ambitious person. First, the clock. She had started doing play school as a host of that. Shake, little dog. Shake, little dog. Shake, shake, shake. Her TV career was on the up, but the same couldn't be said of her marriage. He didn't want her to be hurt. It was not going to work. That marriage was not going to work. The marriage lasted less than one year. And Trisha coped by throwing herself into her career. She had only really been in the country for a small amount of time, and here she was being offered these fantastic jobs. I'm glad that the ABC has had the, uh, how should I call it, guts to see me as, as a, a human being who's capable of presenting. Within two years, she was hosting the most prestigious current affairs program in Australia. Hello and welcome to the 7.30 report. What about Aborigines? You've been quoted as calling them coons. Do they have no, a right that, to stay No, that is in? not so. Not a journalist, not a man and a person of colour, but she did it. With Trisha working round the clock, she was to meet her second husband on the job, TV producer Mark Grieve. Trisha decided to have children with Mark, I think because her biological clock was ticking away. When their daughter Billy was born in 1989, Trisha didn't even take the day off. Uh, as you'll see, I was a bit busy this afternoon. I used to see her early hours of the morning running at full speed with this tricycle thing. And I mean running. And it was only weeks after Billy was born. She did far too much, but that was her. When their second daughter, Maddie, arrived, cracks began to appear in the marriage. Mark had an affair with one of the production staff. Trish found out and confronted him. I think he just felt redundant. I don't think he felt like a man. And I think he sought comfort from other people. And I can understand that. That was it. It's all over. OK, guys, come on, keep going. The work, the tragedies, the pressures of motherhood, it all got too much. Something had to give. Mum had an epic breakdown. It was, it was horrendous. I just remember absolute carnage, my mum crying all the time with tears and snot, and I just thought, what is going on? It's harrowing. No other family were around. It was, it was really tough. Trisha reached rock bottom and attempted suicide. I was very shocked. I thought, you know, is she gonna make it in this life? For her own safety, Trisha was put in a psychiatric unit. She was in a padded room, and she was just sort of rocking on the edge of the bed. I was four or five years old, and my mum just, she was just gone. It was heartbreaking. Is she going to be there for her kids? I was really worried. Tough to watch, mm. tough to hear the daughter talking about it. She was so young at the time. Felt like she'd lost her mum. Your friends thought they may lose you. Do you remember much about it? You know, when you have a breakdown, it sounds silly sitting here talking about it, but at the time, it was just nothing. It was just nothingness. You tried to take your own life. How serious were you at that point? Everybody's serious. There's no such thing as a cry for help. Everybody's serious if you get to that stage. Um, and... To me, it was about just not wanting to be or feel that pain anymore. What brought me back is my baby needed breastfeeding. And there was a nurse there called Elaine. And Elaine, if you're watching this, you know you saved my life. Never mind about the psychiatrist. This one nurse. People were talking about taking my children away from me. And that would have been the end. And Elaine brought toys for Billy to play with. 
she allowed me to be a mum. And she watched and she told me I was a good mum. And that reminded me of my meaning, that I wasn't useless or hopeless. All the voices in my head that told me I was a failure. And this one nurse was the one who got through to me. Billy, you saw your mum at her worst. Now you can see her at her best. What's it been like for you, this, this journey? I'm so proud of Mum. I think, I think especially when you live with someone day in, day out, and you actually see how hard Mum has always worked. I'm, I'm in awe. I think I was a bit resentful when I was growing up, but I think at this age, looking back and even seeing some of these clips up here now, I'm so proud. I can't even... I've got tears in my eyes. I just... Oh. Oh, yeah, you're incredible. I think everyone knows that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. You had a, you know, not much of a physical marriage. You had had sex with oh, him, yeah. unprotected. Yeah. With a man who knew he was HIV positive. Yeah. Hey, how's my little bundle of joy today? Hi, Mum. Your romantic life, to put it mildly, has been eventful. Um, <laughs> tell me about your first husband, an Australian politician called Robert Nestdale. You met him on a plane. Yeah. Oh gosh. We always used to say, never date a passenger. Um, and he courted you uh, very aggressively. Yeah, but yeah. you married this guy within eight months yeah. of meeting him. He was so charming. Um, and and well-connected. Where did you get married? Um, we were married in Sydney. There were the who's who of politicians there. And it was great until the day after the wedding. And what happened? He went back to Canberra. And was that the moment alarm bells began to ring a bit? It was the first ding <laughs> after that, yeah, yeah. He always used to say things to me like, um, I'm very tactile, so people... If anybody ever tells you I'm, uh, I'm homosexual, it's just because I'm tactile. It didn't last very long. Thank God. The marriage. Mm. Um, but then he died in 1989, and you had thought he'd had leukaemia. He told me. But, but it turned out that uh, he died of AIDS. Yeah. And although you had, a, you know, not much of a physical marriage, you had had sex with oh, him. Yeah. Unprotected. Yeah. With a man who knew he was HIV positive. Yeah. I turned up at the hospital to do an HIV test. And you had a three-week wait for the result. Do you remember when you got the negative? Oh, Jesus, yeah. Just before Christmas. Do you know how he got HIV? I mean, did you assume after all that, that maybe he'd been gay, but you think maybe he was leading a double life of some sort? Do you know what? I feel sorry for him. I actually ended up joining the Terence Higgins Trust. That you can't come out. If he'd said to me, you know, people were guessing that I'm gay... You know, if he'd told me... His life must have been hell. But to put my life on the line to cover your secret up? No. Do you sometimes think, Trisha, when you... I mean, but no, we're near the end of your life yet. <laughs> and we've already had this sort of bombshell after bombshell. Do you ever wonder why so much stuff happens to you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me and God have lots of chats about that. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly with me shouting, why? <laughs> <laughs> In 1997, Trisha was headhunted by British TV executives to become the new face of confessional daytime television. Her name was massive in letters. It's kind of like, wow. Trisha was on five days a week from studios in Norwich. I wonder what you think about this. She'd hit fame. People screaming in the street. A controversial show ran for 12 years and was a huge success. And welcome to the ratings-winning Trisha Show. The Trisha Show was always full of drama. Don't you dare stand out and put me down... What Mum did was incredible and iconic. There were pregnancy tests. Not long from now, you're going to have a baby. There was sensational stuff. Ooh. She did give masses of support. You know, she didn't shame people. Onwards, upwards, and leave the murky past behind. Trish is brilliant with people. They can just talk to her about absolutely anything. Kathy here says that swinging has put the oomph back into her marriage. This sort of whole confessional TV extravaganza really kicked off because of her. You're a relationship tissue. You can be used and thrown away. And with fame came fortune. She had a lovely life in Norwich. 
huge house, swimming pool, dogs and all sorts. After two divorces, she'd also found love again with Aussie psychotherapist Peter Jan Francesco. For everybody who's been to hell and back, uh, there is love out there. I finally found the love of my life at 39. I thought they were a terrific couple. He was a very good foil for her. Hi, this is Peter, Trisha's husband, and Maddie, her daughter. He was great with the girls. I mean, they call him Pappy. You like me in that one, Yeah, that's lovely. Sometimes I would like to see you a bit more classically dressed. Old? Uh, no, not old. Ta-da. You're all sorted now, aren't you? Um, oh gosh, am I? I think I've waded through a lot of molasses to get to the, you know, the land of milk and honey. Thank you, hello, and welcome to the show. But in 2008, Trisha's life was turned upside down. I hadn't seen Trisha for about a month. She'd lost weight. And I knew something's up. Sad story from the Daily Mail. Uh, this is Trisha Goddard, who has announced that she's got breast cancer. When you hear of cancer, you just automatically think of the worst. I really didn't know how I was going to deal with potentially losing mum. A lumpectomy and months of chemotherapy lay ahead. We had to shave a hair off. I had a tear there. I had a tear. My husband said, you know, get it cut off, dye it blonde. She just completely trisherized it, didn't she? Mum always likes to share the positive, but people didn't see what, what it was like behind closed doors. It, it was... It was really heartbreaking. I remember this one time, I heard this whimpering. I went into her bathroom and the bath water was stone cold. She was too weak to get out of the bath. And I remember lifting her out of the bath and I think that was the first moment that I realised how much she was actually struggling. I think Mum's issues her whole life has been to present such a strong face and to pretend that everything is fine and that she's coping with everything. And that for me was a really harrowing moment into actually, you know, she is just human. Your life. Mm. Yeah. So now you get hit with cancer. When you found out, what, what did it make you feel? Jeez. Um, After all you've been through. I found out with a laugh and a cry at the same time because I remember the guy doing a, um, an ultrasound and I said to him, so have I got cancer? Yes or no? He said, I'll send the results to your surgeon. I said, Tell me now. He said, no, I'll send the results to your surgeon. And I said, how long have you been doing this for? He said, 19 years. I said, so you know breast cancer when you see it? He said, yes. I said, right, I promise you I won't sue you, but tell me now, do I have breast cancer? <laughs> I said, tell me now, here. And he said, yes. And I went, <gasps> right, OK. Um, I had two operations, seven, eight months chemotherapy, um, basically a year, radiotherapy. And really, I mean, nasty. You know, your veins collapsed. Oh, yeah. You lost nails, still, still uh, ulcers. I mean, you had a brutal experience battling. Yeah, I, apparently I really reacted badly. I had ulcerated nose, mouth. You carried on working. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did anything stop you, or you just...? I... Listen, that show had my name on the back. I remember re ringing up my business partner, the gorgeous... Amazing Malcolm Allsop and saying, Malcolm, I'm really sorry, I've got breast cancer. Um, yeah, only I... you would apologise. <laughs> I know, but I said, I will keep going, I will, I promise, you know. You get over cancer. You're cleared of it. Uh, September 2008, the treatment's over. You tell the press. Great moment, I should think. Yeah, it was. Um... Although I never feel completely out of the woods because every year, because of the nature of my cancer, I have to go back every single year and be checked. And so You're I... never out of the woods with it? Not really. It's, it's remission. You became this massive TV star in the UK. Was that a great feeling? Did you love that being, you know, queen of TV here in the UK? I'm not queen of TV. You we were queen of <laughs> time chat. You were. I don't... Because I was in Norwich, I feel like sort of... Minor princess oh, of Norwich. Partridge came from Norwich. Come on. Ah, I know. <laughs> in his film, he, in, actually in the film, he said, I'm the greatest thing to come out of Norwich since Trisha. We were, <laughs> we were in the pictures watching that. I was like, ah, famous. <laughs> You've been married three times. You're an incurable romantic, clearly. Um, ah, I just like wedding cake. <laughs> <laughs>
Your last marriage broke down in 2017. Why, why was that? Um, I think it was breaking down. I didn't... Uh, 20, let me say by 2017, it was done and dusted, mm. I think. I, uh, that's when I chose to divorce him and I told him the day before. This was your third husband, Peter? Yeah. He met me not uh, too long after my breakdown and he came along a bit like a knight on a white charger and he basically, I think, saved me. Are you difficult to be with? Are of you, course I am. Your second husband, Mark, said in an interview a relationship was rated about five down on her list after her job, her Saab convertible, and her two cats. Somewhere down the bottom was me. I mean, is there an element of truth yeah. to that? Yeah, he was right. It seems to me you're very driven, you're very ambitious. You've been through a lot of traumatic stuff, which probably has made you, I would think, not the easiest person behind closed doors. I'm, I don't know, but I'm just... Am surprised. I Billy? <laughs> you better ask her. Well, we'll come to Billy in a moment. <laughs> She's nodding furiously. Um, are you romantic? No. Not at all? No. You know, flowers and chocolates kind of... Oh, God, no. Candle waste light, no, rose petal bars. No, ugh. Um, I like to kayak, canoe, hike, run. I'm, I'm a tomboy. Hmm. I'm a tomboy. I wouldn't say you're a, a tough person to your detriment, but because you've made yourself tough, you're talking about stuff that might make people emotional, and yet you haven't shed a tear. What does make you cry? What makes you emotional? Like, I'm going to tell you so you can make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> All my Tinder pictures are the real me. <laughs> While you were single, when you were on the dating scene, <laughs> a lot of partying, clubbing, you dated three men at once. I had one boyfriend who was like a party animal, one boyfriend who had a brain, <laughs> one boyfriend, you know, and so I... Did one for each part of the... Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Did uh, they know about each other? Yeah, yeah, they did. Were you actually having three physical relationships? No, 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 two. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you find that when you were back on the single market after your third marriage ended? Oh. What was that? I mean, that must have been a very different experience. Sorry, Piers, I've got to say this, but why is it that men of 50-plus put such lying pictures? They honestly... <laughs> and they come out... You guys, you've been married for 100 years... Let me years. tell you, I don't. But, no. All my Tinder pictures are the real me. <laughs> <laughs> no filters. I know, but these guys have been married forever, they get divorced, and they pick up the dating habits they had while they were at college. Mm. I'm sorry, you do not look like a college jock anymore. Did you start to worry that this was going to be your life? No. Uh... Endless, awful dates with dreadful <laughs> men in their 50s with <laughs> fake pictures? No, I, I, I was quite prepared to stay single. I really was. How many like, times would you say you've been properly in love in your life? Besides my kids? Yeah. That's I mean, with, I mean with men. Where I felt vulnerable and can let my guard down 100%, I'd say probably properly deeply in love. Once. Once? Mm. And that's now? Yeah. You've answered the question, anyway. Once. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to come to the one <laughs> oh, God. in a moment. Let's go to the last VT. Tricia, in your career, nothing short of global domination would ever do. In 2010, America came calling for Tricia. Here to help us, our dear old friend, Tricia Goddard. A regular guest spot on The Mari Show meant she conquered three continents in three decades. This is probably a greatest chapter. I think that intimacy isn't so much, if you pardon expression like that, yeah. it's more with this. To me, she worked miracles for us. She soon had her own daily chat show on NBC. Trisha is probably the most authoritative, smart talk show host I've ever been around. What, how's she like the rest of them? None of them last. And she's back on British TV. Hello, Trisha. Nice to see you. Talking about subjects that are close to her heart. The whole Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, you've been saying it has to be more than just a hashtag. 
For black people, she is so important. I remember when I was a little girl, I used to put, get talcum powder and mix it with water and put it on my face and pretend to be white because, oh, I'm sorry, Lorraine. I no, mean, I, 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 it's, it's hellish. It makes me really, really proud to know Trisha and to know that she has been a big part of getting us to where we are right now. And after so many years tackling other people's problems, Trisha's now taking her own health and well-being much more seriously. I think her antidepressant in life has been physical movement, running around, and that's her resurrection technique. There's only one word to describe Trisha, and that is fit. And I mean in every sense. Come on, I look like that when I get 62, I'll be so happy. But the biggest change is in her love life. She's on to the next. <laughs> She's keeping her new man's identity secret, referring to him just as hashtag boo. I think the hashtag boo thing started as a bit of a joke, but actually, I think she's maybe finally learned that sometimes things, certain things are best kept private. I think it sounds wonderful, so... <laughs> He's a man, and he knows how to look after Trisha. She's extremely happy. You're making me blush now. <laughs> I just wish her all the best. I always have and always will. You know, I love her. Here I go again. She was Paula. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That makes you emotional. That makes me... We've both been through breast cancer as well. And, um, yeah, yeah. Well, come on, then. Who's hashtag boo? He's somebody who's in my heart. Well, it's not just that organ, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Are you really going to keep him a secret? Yeah. What we do know, he's a widower, he's a single dad, he didn't date again until his kids went to university, we think he's American, and he has a hashtag yes, yeah. boo. Yeah. But you want to keep his identity private because you've learned by bitter experience if you don't, it all becomes headline material? Yeah, that and I met him in a different life. I wasn't a Trisha. You know, my other partners, I was a Trisha, mm. TV person. Um, Did he know who you were when you met him? No, he, he didn't know. And when I was dating again after my last marriage, you know what I bore in mind? This could be your last relationship of your life. Mm. And every guy I even had one date with, I'd look at them and say, do you want to go to your grave only having known this guy? <laughs> Next! <laughs> <laughs> He's also, we're told, um, allowed you to rediscover the joys of sex. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give Billy a sick bag. <laughs> Billy? Yeah. Hide your ears, you won't want to hear this. I haven't rediscovered it. I've discovered it. <laughs> Seriously? Really? Yeah. So you found true love, Trisha? I damn well hope so. Christ, I'm not going through this again. <laughs> <laughs> Is he rich? With love. <laughs> <laughs> love ain't gonna buy your shoes, baby. <laughs> You've dropped a few clues about Boo on Instagram. And um, we've done a little montage oh, of all your no. clues. <laughs> Try and build a picture. We've got various body parts. His, his feet, hands, his ears, his lips. We've also unearthed a picture of somebody who we believe you dropped as a potential clue. Yeah, that was him when he was younger. So that is him, <laughs> looking like some Greek god in the ocean. <laughs> Does he still look like that? <laughs> An older version. <laughs> An older version. Are you gonna, you gonna marry this guy? It does beg the question, why wouldn't you? You've had three marriages that didn't work. <laughs> this is true love at last. You're asking the wrong person. Well, I should be asking him. No. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We're happy... To, to be honest, we're happy as we are. If he was to pop the question, how many seconds would it take you to say yes? You'll be the first to know. <laughs> <laughs> really. Do, do not buy your hat and gloves yet. <laughs> As we sit here, lots of rumours you're planning a sensational return to UK television. Any truth to them? Yeah, this is where I act coy. Are you excited about the potential of coming back here to work? 
things in the pipeline. <laughs> don't want to give too much away. No, no, I am Yeah, yeah. You've interviewed 40,000 people. If you were sitting where I'm sitting, what would be the last question that you would ask yourself about your life? How do you want to die? Wow. Well, how do you want to die? Like Mummy died. Mummy died in my arms at home, nursed to the end. And I know I'm with a partner who would do that, and I would do that for him, and that's the first time. Well, you've had many brushes with death, so actually yeah. you've had to think about death a lot. Especially... And what you're saying is you finally got to a place where it doesn't terrify you because no. you've got someone who would be there to, yeah. to hold you. And if that moment came in hopefully a very long time, what do you want people to think about you? When they think of Trisha Goddard... She was real. You know what? It's exactly what you are. Thank You're you. the real deal. Trisha, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.